Hey everybody, what's up? My name is Jackie Smith and you are watching Into the Necrosphere. My guest today is Nathaniel Underwood of Damim, and if the name doesn't ring a bell, it's because uh, up until about two or three years ago, they used to be called Dam. They also took about 12 years to bring out a new album, which turns out was well worth the wait. Uh, that record, of course, is a fine game of nil, which came out on Apocalyptic Witchcraft Records earlier this year. So if you haven't checked it out yet, I'll post a link in the description, or you can look them up on Bandcamp. Before I get to that chat, though, if you like this video, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notifications bell, and check in every Tuesday, because that's when I'm going to be posting a new episode. Uh, and remember that you can watch that episode uh, right here on YouTube, or you can check out the show on Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, or any other preferred podcasting platform of your choice. Uh, also, stick around uh, at the end of the interview because I am going to be launching my weekly recurring um, segment, What I'm Cranking This Week, which will be a uh, about five minutes of me telling you what to listen to for the next week. Um, and on that bombshell, let's get on with the show. My chat with Nathaniel Underwood of Damham is up right after this. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a bit of a crash course this because I I so I used to write for Chronicles of Chaos for about eight years and then I did um, Metal Rules for a couple more years and then I stopped with it altogether and mm -hmm. then I just I've always kind of wanted to start my own thing again um, but I don't want to really I don't, I don't really want to be under any obligation to have to review you know nine hundred bands that all sound like in flames um, and interview a bunch of bands that I'm not interested in talking to so I kind of want to be able to just you know, I have, you know, I have a career, I have my own job. I don't want to have to make, I don't want it to be work. So I want to speak to people who I think are interesting, people whose music I like and, you know, pe people that I think, you know, there's a, there's a potential to, uh, to, to have an interesting conversation with, which is kind of where, so the, where the idea actually, came about. Uh, you're actually preaching to the choir here because I, uh, I wrote for Terrorizer back in, uh, in the olden days. Um, for a few years i couldn't yeah. tell how many but it was like at least four maybe five um uh in the sort of i don't know if i started in late 90s or early 2000s but it was around that that time and at first it was very exciting you know like i was still newish to london and being able to go to all these gigs all of a sudden and getting this influx in new music and seeing my name in print and all that kind of stuff it was great and i used to enjoy doing the reviews whether the bands were good or not i might add um and it was it was quite a cool time because there were a couple of names uh that, that you'd look for in the reviews because you knew they would at least be funny especially if the score was low yeah. um because yeah. They, you know, they they wouldn't just take down the bands they didn't like. They would justify it, but also add in humor. You know, I felt sorry for some of those bands, but at the same time. But anyway, that was that was great. And then it just got to like even six albums a month, and it was all kind of there was a lot of black metal that sounded the same at the time, and it just it you it numbs you completely and same with the gigs you become you see all these really great bands and at the time i don't know i think cannibal corpse and morbid angel both were at the time where they toured like at least once every 18 months or something so you got to see all these great bands and you but you just couldn't you got jaded by the live performances and you couldn't tell the wood from the trees as far as the the reviews were concerned and it was and plus there was the, this kind of chore like impetus to mm. have to actually do it so it was yeah it was i i know how you feel is what i'm trying to say yeah i <clears throat> i made an attempt to get back into it but i just couldn't find the motivation you know and and when you you know you have a career and music and other things it's just 
I get yeah, very often I, I felt like the, the the labels don't really get that you have a career and that you're doing it for you know for, for the love of doing it so you've got these messages you know these emails chasing you where's the review for this where's the review for that and it's like okay so how many ways am I going to say this sounds like an inflames demo or it sounds like somebody's trying to copy slaughter of the soul it sucks <laughs> zero so it's like you know and you also you know but at the same time you feel bad because you meet so many bands and you speak to so many people and you know I, I've been in, uh, in in very very low level bands myself I know how much work it takes to actually yeah create. that's the other thing that is so definitely it, true yeah so it's kind of like no, no matter no matter how much the music sucks I also don't want to run the guys down because you know yeah. it, it took a hell of a lot of effort to do what they did you know it was a lot of time a lot of energy it might be misguided but you know be that as it may uh, and so it, it just kind of yeah i totally agree with you it got it got to the point where it was a chore but i recognized your name because i, I think so so when about did you write for terrorize it was like 2001 to sort of 2004 yeah. 2005 yeah so that was right around the time that i came to the uk Okay. Um, and I remember specifically always looking at your, you know, they, they always have the like, you know, what, what the writers are listening to at the moment. I used to specifically yep. look at your name because you would always, okay. look, you would always be listening to stuff that I'd be interested in. Mm-hmm. So I kind of use that as a guide as to, as to what I'm going to go, um, what I'm going to go listen to, what I'm going to go buy next. But I, as soon as I saw your name, I was like, Jesus, that sounds really familiar. And I mean, I know, I know Jason, I know Akrakaka, so I knew it from there, but it was like, it, it just suddenly rang a bell of, you know, we used to write for Terrorizer. Um, I had another point uh, about, I can't remember, something about the um, um, bands that put a lot of effort into it. And yeah, th- I mean, uh, yeah, two, two things. Well, firstly, there is that. And there's also, you know, the, ultimately it's subjective. It's, it's, really, it's really difficult because there's this sort of continuous spectrum between these two ideals that uh, that don't exist. The sort of ultimately subjectively good and ultimately objectively good in a sort of you know technical sense that you can pin down and the kind of the skill of the writing and and you know something that's culturally not been done before. Mm. But like neither of those really exist, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's it's and and just everything exists on that spectrum. So it is possible that something that you really don't like, which you don't think is objectively good, is still actually subjectively excellent to a great number of people for like um, completely different reasons. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. Case in point, Iron Maiden. So I'm probably, I may have to edit this out, but I'm probably throwing out all my no, my, my metal credentials out the window. But I, it's just a band. I, you know, I grew up with people that were into them. They were always one of the bands that's kind of on the roadmap to you getting into heavier stuff. Yeah. I just never liked them. I thought first oh, heavy album I ever heard was I made them. I, I thought Live After Death was great. Yes, Everything that else was just, the one. Just, that was it. <laughs> Oh, there you go. We, we I just thought every- it was on a tape. We listened to it four times in a row, and we, well, at least, and it was like, yeah, this is amazing. But I, I was eleven, and I'd never heard anything like it at the time. So, yeah, mine was. I was, I was nine. I heard um, Thunderstruck, and yeah. ironically, I was on my way to church when, when I turned the TV on and it was playing, and then uh, kind of Thunderstruck led into Metallica, led into Guns and Roses, then. Um, I made and then, but at around the same time as, as uh, you know, people that I knew were getting into I made and I was also getting into Pantera and into Sepultura and yeah. Slayer. And there was kind of an edge to that that I just, I was just drawn to a lot more than I made. I mean, I made to this day, it feels very safe and I've never been a big fan of music that sounds like that. I, you know, I think a band like Killing Joke is a lot heavier than I made because there's a real nastiness and a real danger to a lot of Killing Joke songs. I think it's absent it's... from I made I think with time it's lost its edge, but if you think back to you know the the early eighties, like especially the first two albums, they're they're really quite aggressive and nasty, and they hadn't defined their their kind of almost you know um, philanthropic, socially con- you know concerned agenda. Yeah, like two you know two minutes to midnight. I, a lot of people from outside or, or whatever they they might think it's actually something about 
you know, new, similar to nuclear war now, let's end the human race, when actually it's about, oh, isn't this, it, it's terrible that we're getting so close to extinction. And before they got to that point, it was more about making heavy music about violent themes kind of thing to some extent, I think, anyway. But, um, but yeah, so after a while, yeah, obviously it's, it's kind of, I, I know what you mean. It's a lot more, let's say, parentally accept, acceptable, especially yeah. at the time. Yeah. But nowadays it's completely been absorbed into the mainstream as it was yeah. so but you make a very good point as well about the about writing and how it's kind of it, it captures a moment in time and, and you know example of that i remember when i reviewed corins and um the, the akakaka album for for chronicles of chaos i gave it seven and a half out of ten it is now my favorite album of all time hmm. it was one of those things where I heard the album, I liked it, but it was actually seeing the band live subsequent, you know, a couple of times subsequent where I remember seeing them at, uh, there was a show that, uh, that, that they were supposed to support DSI, DSI canceled. And you know, a friend, a friend of mine and myself were there. We thought, Oh fuck it. We'll, we'll just hang around here anyway. And I mean, it, it just blew my mind. I went back, listened to the album straight away. I was like, this is actually so much better than I thought. But at the same time, that also was one of that's actually probably one of the first steps towards me thinking maybe the you know I wanted to kind of cool it on the writing thing. I couldn't spend as much time with music as I used to anymore, and mm-hmm. you know because it's just it's this conveyor belt. It's like nine albums, and then okay, boom, 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 boom. We have to get yeah. Out. You you have to in order to write a review that does it justice, you have to take the time to give the music a chance. And some of my favorite albums I did not like the first month even. Mm. I you know all the first four listens and then it, it the penny drops or progressively or you know over the course of time and actually in retrospect they're brilliant so um in terms of Akakoka first time I, I saw them I think was the first ever gig in 97 or 98 at the Red Eye and I they hadn't released anything so I hadn't heard anything on record mm. and it was just they were just head and shoulders above all the other bands that night and it was fantastic and i could like some of the tunes actually stuck with me afterwards even though i hadn't had anything on record that's quite a feat for any band yeah right? no, and and when Karonzen came it was the third album so the first two are kind of a little bit production wise there, there is room for improvement, I think. Um, I think they would all agree about the first one. I know Dave's really fond of um, Goat and the sound of it. But I, th- I think it's just kind of a bit sharp and strident, but not in the right places, as it were. And with Caronzon, it was the first one with, I think, Neil. So it was the first kind of, worldly producer so to speak who really did something with the music and to my mind it was like yes finally it sounds like it's supposed to Mm. so yeah it's it's for me it's a kind of pinnacle for the band i think different people have different ones like what is it words is a a favorite of many i know etc but anyway yeah yeah, I was curious also, and I and I mentioned to you before we, you know, before the interview, I was something I wanted to talk about, and it was because I, I we all started turning about you being a writer, having been a writer, having been, you know, you know, ha- having kind of cast a critical, probably a more critical glance than the average person over other people's music. Did do you feel like that has ever made you, or did that ever make you feel self conscious or self aware when you were doing anything for your own music? Definitely not. <laughs> and the, you, you don't, well, I, I don't, nobody I know does write for, you know, the critics. Obviously, it's nice to receive praise, but ultimately, it doesn't really matter. You know, what what kind of remains is the record you know, when, when all the reviews have been forgotten, there's still that piece of music. It, it, yeah, it's, it just, 
I'd go further and say that in the grand scheme of things, the the the, the like in terms of the creative process, the the, the prospect of critical praise or lack thereof or whatever is totally irrelevant. Um, yeah, I couldn't put it any more clearly. Uh, but I mean, okay. So conversely, then, how how self-critical are you? You know, how how hard are you in yourself? <clears throat> Well, um, it, there are a number of reasons why it took, you know, that many years to get the album together. And one of them is that in order for something to be suitable for being committed to a permanent medium and subsequently released, it needs to sit right and it's not there's no kind of like there isn't really an intellectual like approval process or you know there's not a kind of list of boxes that need to be ticked like it needs to be this technical and it needs to you know have this many kind of convoluted bits and whatever it's it's really it just needs to feel right and it's it's about as elusive as it sounds and every time you finish writing a song or at least for me and you finally got to that point like l almost literally as soon as you have you get to the other side and you wonder how you you managed to do it let alone how you're going to think about doing it again because every time you write something new it's a completely new you know prospect like there, there are certain i suppose ways of and methods of of going about you know spurring the creative process but everything every ingredient that you put into it needs to be something that you find stimulating at the time if if you know what i mean so it's more about yeah just working through it and then working through it again and then if it doesn't feel right having the confidence in your vision no matter how well or poorly defined it is and having confidence in your taste to just go no this isn't right yet we need to continue working on it and yeah i i suppose that's that's the thing just believing that you can do it and trusting your your instinct those are the two things really you know forget about any kind of factor like musical ability or anything like that it's it's those things are way more important does that make sense yeah no, absolutely and it makes sense especially you know i've, I've listened to the album quite a few times now and the one thing if I had to describe it in a word, I, I think the songs are incredibly expressive. Okay. And what you just said there now, it, it, it you know, kind of suggests that it's, it's, it's a very emotionally involving process for you to write a song, which then would, oh, yeah. certainly you, as far you, as my experience of the album is concerned. Okay. Well, you, you need to like plow through the, 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 the kind of the, the material and kind of work it and rework it until you have like uh, a nub of or a stub of something usable um, and then kind of build on that expand it combine it with other things play it over and over again until you get bored with that and you maybe screw up one of the endings and you end up going oh actually that sounds good or you know you you, you're jamming with someone else and they'll come up with something spontaneously or they'll bring a, a, a kind of harmony to it or something. Um, but the same, it's the same sort of, it's a kind of equivalent process with the lyrics, but it's also completely different because you, you have to, lyrics aren't satisfying if they're in any way generic. Okay, I'm not saying I've never, written a line that could be construed as generic or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination but it it's always a lot better if there is actually 
you know meaning and layers of meaning so it's kind of you have to capture these thoughts and these like notions as they come through your head because you'll always have them just appearing and you're like oh yeah i need to remember that and then within a few hours or the next day if you haven't noted it down it's gone or it, you know you might eventually come across it again if you sort of see the same sequence of things or something but basically you know you need to capture those down and you need to kind of join the dots or you need to string them together into something that makes some sort of sense to you at least personally um and when i say some sort of sense i don't necessarily mean it in a the, the lyrics don't necessarily um encompass a single idea per song or anything like that and it's not necessarily a story but you wouldn't be able to get that kind of journey with any other arrangement of words if 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 you you know what i'm getting at so mm. anyway but coming back to the actual process you have this kind of map of uh or map or just swathe of of words and shapes and sequences and maybe you've even got like something that makes some sort of coherent sense as a piece of writing on its own which is what i always try to aim for um but that doesn't mean you'll be able to fit it to music right and there's always the kind of when you try and put it to a song you know do you have enough words or do you have too many or are you able to actually say speak that kind of phrase with the kind of the rhythm and the lung capacity and does it make sense if you pitch it at that note and so that's that's always a kind of a, a thing in itself and then you end up throwing away half of it and bringing in something else that you hadn't thought about but then that ends up making a lot more sense in terms of the music and you know i i want again i like to do to write sequences of words that stand on their own but that doesn't mean that that's the only way to write lyrics either so uh, an example that i think is quite good about effective mantra like simplicity is something like god flesh you know if you look at the words printed it doesn't look necessarily particularly spectacular but in conjunction with the music it just brings out this whole new dimension to both the words and the music and that's that's another way of writing which i i suppose i haven't really explored for the reasons i've just mentioned but anyway that's that's kind of the the the, the lyrical construction journey in in a nutshell yeah and it's yeah. I, you know, if I understand you correctly, and I, I, I think I do, it's presenting abstract, sort of abstract ideas or abstract sentiments and and, and emotions in a way that's that's um, that has meaning, but is ambiguous enough to be reinterpreted. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and it uh, a lot of them have different parallel threads of meaning. Um, for example this is something I'll, I'll i'll try and play around with whether it's for the sake of the, the kind of the semantics or the the you know poetic license or whatever or whether it's for the sake of trying to fit them to music but you can strategically invert you, you know you'll have a sentence that means something and if you strategically invert it like move around some of the words you still keep a sense of the original meaning but you tend to start to build different layers into it. And then maybe in the next line or so, you can add something that calls back to one of those words, but then through the kind of the juxtaposition of synonyms and connotations, you actually bring out a new, um, newly significant aspect of what you've just written, for example, Does that makes sense. 
Yeah, no, hundred percent. And it's, I mean, it's always been my favorite lyrics are, are, are lyrics that I can read over and over and over again. And they, they speak to me in a different way every time either I, you know, every, every time I read them or in, you know, three, four years time, if my, my life is in a different place, I, I interpret the lyrics in a different way. And it, you know, there's sort of a refreshed meaning coming out of it because of that. Totally. Um, actually a lot of the time the, the, the meaning of, the words or the, the song is becomes a lot more apparent with more distance because when you are involved in this whole process you just you you can't really you well you don't see the whole picture so you can't really necessarily pin everything down as it were yeah so so basically i'm repeating what you're saying with but with different words well, that's pretty much the concept of the of what we just spoke about. But uh, how how old are some of the ideas that are on uh, a fine game of nil? Because I mean, you know, I think it's twelve years that it took you to write a new album. Um, are we talking about the music, uh, the lyrics, or both? Both. Um, there's um, last song. All I want to know is how it ends the kind of the oldest riff assembly with the kind of the, at the very start. I think I probably played that the first time, just the very start, let's say the first 30 seconds or so. Um, that was a thing that was kicking about since the early 2000s easily. Right. So that just hadn't found a suitable you know group of song mates you know so it didn't have a, a, a the right space to to live in so some of the ideas that's probably the oldest one to be fair but a lot of the time you get really old stubs or riffs that just haven't found the right home and you combine them with things that you've jammed more recently. Maybe there's a new technique and you scale something you've heard that spurs you to try a different kind of chord sequence or technique. And that'll tend to be a lot kind of fresher and, you know, the tip of your fingers and that'll live with you for, you know, a few months or something and you'll, all of a sudden find a way to combine it with that and then a lot of the time you, you well most of the songs that tend to be you know to, to to feel right will tend to have a um a, a, a spontaneous component as well so when you're in a a rehearsal or teaching the riffs or or something or other you something spontaneous will happen and that will tend to be that the kind of the gel that holds it together there's also an important factor which i haven't mentioned until now which is the fact that a lot of this um composition works with the axis of drums and guitar so it's about the the kind of the interplay between the rhythmic and melodic patterns of the guitar and the kind of the rhythms of the drums and how they can sit with the drums and how the different flourishes or different pulses can highlight a different kind of aspect of the, the composition, right? And the layering and whatnot. And more, more than that, the way that a, a, a given drummer will respond to certain parts, certain compositions, will actually determine which ones are used and taken further and which ones tend to stay on the, the, the or, you know, in the riff bank, as it were. Um, and so that will also shape the arrangement right so that that dynamic is actually very important it's not 
you know, I have written songs without drummers as well. Um, good example is Outside on Difference Engine. That was completely guitar from A to Z, you know, with a metronome or head or whatever. But that's more the exception than the rule. Um, and they tend to have a kind of, um, they tend to be more work to get the, the rhythm section and the drummer especially to kind of take to it. You have to, again, believe in your vision and say, no, look, trust me, if we learn it like that, it's going to end up sounding and feeling right kind of thing. Hmm. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's another part of the dynamic which is really important, which is how things work with the drummer. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, as, as much as it kind of took a while for this new album to come out, it, it feels to me like probably from about 2016, the momentum, you know, really started to build behind the band again. And, you know, you know, this new album has come out with, you know, massive music video, which I think, you know, speaks to the vision that you mentioned before. Um, you know, you guys are a lot more active as far as playing shows are concerned. First question that arises out of that is after being around for as long as you as you've been, how does it feel to be referred to in magazines and on the internet as new blood? Because I think Louder Sound actually specifically referenced you guys as new blood. Well, we were, so there's, there's a couple of aspects to that. Firstly, first and foremost, we're not going to complain if we get exposure, mm. right? And it, this is something that isn't unusual either you you'll see in the media all the time you know oh this these great new hot bands that have you know that are really doing things and doing exciting stuff and when you look into it actually they've been going for at least a decade or something like that and it's just that the 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 media happens to just have noticed secondly there was a sort of i i guess a, a to an extent a, a a reinvention because the lineup was significantly different enough and that the, it was a it was a new dynamic to a large extent so in a sense that's half true and thirdly um when we got offered to play bloodstock um sophie stage was full so they went well you know you can headline the last day on the um, new blood stage so we were playing new blood stage and it's you know it's it's fine <laughs> i i i didn't have a problem with it um so yeah what whatever i i missed you guys at uh at dsi because i had a I, I, something to do with work that i that, that made that i could see that show but you know I, again just based on things that I've been reading on uh, forums, websites, et cetera, you seem to be, or, or the band seems to be getting a lot more confident as a, as a live act, um, you know, and, and I think that's really starting to show in some of the reviews that you guys are getting and some of the feedback that you're getting, you know, firstly, what was it like playing Bloodstock and, and what is it like, what is it like playing live now in comparison to what it was a decade ago? Um, well, we we have existed as a confident live act you know the the kind of the previous incarnation with when it was especially after we did that tour with decapitated uh in 2005 we spent was it 2005 i think so anyway we spent like four weeks on a tour bus with you know a total of 16 17 people it was it was kind of crazy going around europe and playing almost every night there were only a couple of days off so when you do that we you know we had a a, a gap of a, a couple of months and we had another live show actually supporting entombed which was great um but it was like we didn't have to think about it we just went we played and it was it was confident and same 1349 tour that was that was pretty that was something i would i, I would have considered a solid at the time i think we've 
taken our game to a new level for a number of things. We've kind of been paying a lot of attention to certain details and certain aspects and being mindful of certain things which just weren't necessarily on the radar back then but the kind of the confidence comes from the fact that we know we we know where we are as it were and we know that we know what we're doing so if you don't have to worry so much about what other people are doing if you know that they're bearing the same aspect of whatever you want to call it stagecraft or or you know just the the music itself if you don't have to worry about that then you can actually focus on what you're doing and if something happens like the monitors aren't ideal you you know you can work with that anyway and it's about what you project as much as anything else if you start kind of looking around at each other in a kind of worried and sheepish way people are going to pick up on that so you just have to go and do it whatever the case and as long as you can hear that one symbol at the beginning of the bar <laughs> and, and like a murmur of the, the snare drum um, then you, you'll find we are also lucky enough to work with uh, to have flow as, as one of our you know number and He's just, he's, he's the most consistent drummer I've, I've ever played with. And I, I like, he makes an effort to play everything at the right tempo and with the right kinds of um, punctuation uh, markers, as it were, so that we don't have to, to worry about that side of things. And that's that's huge, like that really, that makes a phenomenal difference. Um, but um, yeah, what was the question again? <laughs> just to, just around confidence in playing and, and how you how you felt playing Bloodstock this year, what your experience was of playing Bloodstock this year. Well, um, anyone who's ever played a festival, um, it's it's always a similar kind of experience. You're, you, 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 it's, it's kind of a production line in terms of the, the running and you, you're one of dozens of bands on that stage that weekend. And so it's, it's really, you know, okay, put your stuff here, bang, 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 line check, bang, perform. Usually the sets are relatively short and, get off stage and that's it and you know there's no sound check there's no kind of um chance to ease into the experience and and there tends to be a lot of waiting around a lot more than you would expect for another show as well um and it also means that the the kind of the setup isn't going to be as tailored for you as you might normally come to expect unless you know you're one of the headliners I suppose um, but um, but yeah that's it's it's always a different kind of challenge but I think we uh, we met it well we performed and um and the kind of the sound came across reasonably well i was told um you know the the the, the i think the way that we put songs together as well as well as our uh, the, the kind of our technical setup tends to help in terms of making the life of the engineers easier as it were but um yeah it was good, but not as good as DSI. You, you, the first three bands actually at that show, actually all the bands on that bill were really good and really worked, lived up to, to, to the, the kind of the expectations. Um, you know, whether we're talking about an Oxide 
Crescent Christian Day side. It was it was really good night, and and the, our monitors were great, and it was really easy to get into it. And there was you know it was packed by the time we we came on stage, etc. That yeah, that was that was really good. I mean, we we spoke earlier about you know when I first arrived in the country and you know sort of what the thinking about what the scene was like then versus what it's like now. Um, I'd be interested to get your observations on things as a, as a, as a musician, you know, playing to different crowds, seeing how the crowd has changed. Now the crowd has evolved, you know, how, how do you feel about the way London is like at the moment or, or sorry, what the, what the London crowds are like at the moment, what the, what the UK music scene generally is like but, uh, at the moment. Um, when I arrived in London, I don't know about, when you did but um it sounds like it was only a few years apart if any um being into heavy metal or thrash metal or death metal was not the thing right it was fall to the floor house really terrible house and new metal were the sort of the things to that that were that ruled at that time and it was somewhat difficult at the same time there was a crowd there was you know a critical mass of people who were into that sort of thing and there were there were gigs and there were underground shows etc there was like the red eye and the peel and the standard and but it was few and far between although there were quite a few you know good shows things like the underworld la2 and whatnot um but um now it's completely different there's there's a real i don't want to say to use the word scene because it's so loaded with connotations but there's there's a real um set of bands whether it's you know black metal or thrash metal or death metal or you know grime or whatever there are actually bands out there is actually happening to um, quite an extent and there's a real crowd out there that there are actually quite a few people you, you know just you don't even need to think about bloodstock as an example just which you know whichever scene whether it's you know do more um, um, or, or hardcore or something along those lines it's that isn't the, the kind of the extreme metal types that we're talking about generally here um, there will be a crowd who turns up and make the gig worth happening and that's there are also a lot of people complain about you know venues and things closing and whatnot and that's unfortunate but there's still so much more than there used to be at the time um yeah i mean just just generally as far as the the uk scene right now is concerned um you know what are your feelings about it do you do you feel a level of you know do you feel the same as i do you know that there's a there's kind of a real golden age of creativity and a golden age of great bands at the moment it's uh, funny you should use that phrasing because um, I actually used that in, I don't know if it was an interview or in communication with someone who uh, actually, Ryan uh, from uh, Cryptic Shift, who hasn't been around for as long, just by, by virtue of not having been around <laughs> for as long. And um, it's, it may be difficult to get that perspective because of what I spoke about earlier in terms of early 2000s. It was a bit of a 
wasteland in some ways. I mean, there was activity, there was still great things happening. There was still that sense of the excitement that you had by virtue of the fact that fans were rarer, right? You weren't in a saturated market. So when a band came to town, it tended to be someone of a certain status, as it were, you know, like Orbit Angel or Deicide or whatever. But um, the, the, there's, I think there are a number of bands, artists, people doing exciting and interesting things that haven't been done before or that are that haven't been done in that particular way or ideas that haven't been stolen and in, you know incorporated into one particular kind of metal sculpture that hasn't been done before and yes i agree that's great um there's always danger of it being lost in the noise because there are many 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 bands out there with you know significant followings with which are doing some of them are, are mediocre others are actually really good but overall the standard has also been brought up in terms of proficiency um work ethic professionalism you know you kind of if you want any chance of making it in any way shape or form whether you define what those terms are yourself or not you need to come to the the the, the stage as it were come to the the subcultural environment with a certain amount of togetherness that maybe wasn't the kind of the baseline 20 years ago right um but have so so you know you, you have all of these acts this this sea of 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 music you know uh, somebody put it uh, one way which was post scarcity so the, the the upside of the the post scarcity you know barrage of of noise of of bands trying to get the audience's attention is there is actually there are actually you know many more gems hidden hidden in there than overall than there would have been again 15 20 years ago um and yes i do think we are in a kind of golden age and i do think that the cultural climate in the uk and the, the kind of the history and the way people perceive and think about things and the way it's a kind of its very own melting pot does make the stuff that this country produces quite unique and they are still a, a lot still there are a, a, a real a, there's a sizable number of acts and bands doing interesting things noteworthy things that actually push the envelope in one way or another or you know maybe reassert a, a kind of old, older genre that hasn't been really visited in a while but with with more kind of different angles and so on like giving thrash a real kind of progressive and uh expansive edge is uh is i i suppose cryptic shift because they they're really with it they're together they're doing the, the kind of the concept thing and i i know they have a lot more ideas in their um up their sleeve that they're waiting to unleash and so on um but um there are also a lot of really cool, interesting bands in, in the US, for example, that we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily exposed to. Um, 
and actually that there is a perception this is from a conversation i had earlier this week that the us isn't having a great time in terms of um you know numbers are, are not growing kind of thing which which surprises me because to me in in cultural terms the uh the, the us is a lot more um has let's say rock and heavy guitar music a lot more embedded in its in in its cultural background you know it's it's a lot more normal to have kind of hard rock and heavy metal played at sporting events right you you just wouldn't think you you'd never hear that at, at, at a football match or something like that in quite yeah, the yeah. same bombastic way you wouldn't hear like ear splitting acdc over the speakers um but apparently it's it's just not as happening and i think germany is as big of a market at the moment or nearly as big of a market as the us which is crazy you know it's it's what a quarter of the the population or something like that maybe maybe a bit more i'm not sure about my demographics here but it's a fraction of the size and yet so i do think there is a you know there are a lot of interesting things happening in europe in us elsewhere as well um i, I wouldn't be able to you know give you any uh, competent confident um like statements about the the state of the scene in say uh, you know india or whatever but um or the far east but we we are seeing more acts like i can't remember that chinese black metal band who toured quite recently um but that's that's quite new as a phenomenon and uh crescent who we played with at the day side show you know well they started in egypt half of them are based in germany but they're basically an egyptian death metal band um really good one at that and yeah the, the 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 awareness of the subculture has spread to the extent that it's just reaching all these corners of the world which wouldn't normally have been exposed to it say 20 years ago or even 15 or even 10 in to quite the same extent so in short, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely I, I agree with you about the, the 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 tentacles of the subculture going out into into various corners of the globe. And I'm the thing that I, I'm finding most impressive um, and have done for probably the last kind of three four years is the quality of debuts that are coming out. It's just it's staggering to me. You know, debut very often. You know, as I'm sure you know, the band is slightly uncertain. You know, they're still. There's kernels of great ideas there, but there's there's it, it it used to kind of be about promise and potential more so than the finished article. But I mean, yeah. if I think about Selps, Odasis, um, I mean, those are the first two that come to mind. There's a, there's 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 a ton of others, but it's just bands that they'll, they'll, they'll bring out an album and you'll kind of go into their back catalog and you're like, they brought out a four song EP prior to that, and that's that's it. But I mean, they oh. are they're doing things that surpass you know, genre legends who are bringing out new music by, you know, significant margins. Um, so a couple of points on that. So I think that's a side effect of the, what I mentioned earlier, which is the necessity of, you know, hitting the ground running as a band and having things together on so many fronts at the same time in order to even have a look in to any kind of continuation of exposure right um so that's one thing there's also the democratization of the means of audio production right so 20 years ago even what well, that that was that was the kind of the beginning of the the real dissemination of um fairly you know accessible um digital audio workstations so 
first time I made a demo with a band, we had two tape players, tape recorders. Okay, and we're not talking four track, we're talking stereo tape recorders and and a mixer and some microphones. And so we had to record the songs pretty much live, drums, bass, guitar, because we didn't have that, sorry, drums, guitar, guitar, because we didn't have enough channels. And then once we did that, I overdubbed the bass and the vocals. And the end result, you know, it's, it's really immediate, has this sort of the urgency of the, the tape demo, but it's so noisy, right? And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound bad, you know, but we, we just didn't really know what we were doing at the time. But beyond that, t when we got to an eight track recording, that was like, wow, professional. You know, that's amazing. An, an ADAT, a thing that looks like a VCR, that you need this, all this extra gear to make work properly. And now you can make music with a fairly standard computer and this software that you download from the internet. And you can do, if, you, if you're canny about it and you've actually researched stuff, you know, the information that's publicly available to pretty much everyone, you can actually make something that sounds really decent with practically zero budget. Okay, so as soon as you start putting in a bit more work and budget, you just, things get that much better. Yeah. And, and so, um, I can't remember who it was. I think that it was um, a friend of mine was talking about the insect warfare um, kind of compilation retrospective you know, and the recordings were like 2004 to 2010 or something like that. I can't remember the exact dates, but he was surprised how good the demos sounded. But if you think about it, that's not that long ago and that tech was already available. So it's not, we're not talking about, you know, early nineties, four tracks. We're talking about already people with real technology, um, accessible to them and um and yeah so um i can't remember what the other point was um demos um debut albums yeah i i think i actually i think i covered pretty much what i wanted to cover in that uh, i'll 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 tell you if it comes back to me <laughs> i'm gonna I'll, i'm gonna close off with with one final question and it's um uh, you know, it's personal curiosity as much as anything else. The the name change for the band, what what necessitated it? You know, what made you decide? Is it kind of part of a reinvention, or was it just? That's to be honest. That's just a side effect. The main driver was the fact that when when the name was first coined, there weren't really any other active bands. If I was to do it again, I probably would do it differently anyway, but because the fact is if you have a three letter name of any description there just aren't that many permutations you know it's like you never choose a three letter password three character password <laughs> because it'll you know it'll be guessed that in in an instant kind of thing by any kind of machine worth its salt but same kind of principle applies and not only that but at the time where I, I went, okay, we've got to cut our losses. Um, there were at least three or four other metal bands, active metal bands with the same name. And also it's just not Google friendly. Mm -hmm. You know, you search for that. And even if you do damn band, you, you're, you're still not going to hit the right kind of results and it's, I don't know it's not even about search engine op optimization or anything like that it's just about having something that's a bit more distinctive where you don't have you know a, a, a hip-hop band with the same name and a Brazilian power metal band and an Ecuadorian Christian death metal band and you, you know it's just it just got got silly so it had to had to change and the the kind of the fact that it coincided with 
the new actualized lineup is, I suppose, a serendipitous, but yeah, beyond that, n not really. <laughs> That's really it. Yeah. Well, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the actualized lineup and what you guys were able to achieve, I, you know, I, I absolutely love the new album. Congratulations. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to talk to me. And no, um, thank you. hopefully we'll catch up again at some point down the road. I certainly hope so. Uh, and uh, let me know when you're at a gig next time. Oh, uh, make sure you mention in, I don't know, the notes or whatever that uh, we're playing a tour with Hour of Penance in December. So that's that's the the dates we have for the time being working on others, obviously. But um, yeah, make sure uh, you, if if you don't mind, uh, you you mention that and encourage people to go to the the link to purchase and stream the album. Streaming is sadly also important. Absolutely, so, and I will definitely be at that show as well. So hopefully, I'll see you there. Great, nice awesome. one. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, mate. Take care. You too. Bye bye. <laughs>again to nathaniel for taking the time to talk to me if you're in the uk and you want to check them out uh when they tour later this year um you can check them out with hour of penance and cryptic shift in leeds on the 10th of december uh and nottingham on the um, 11th of december um, December the 12th at Nambuka in London and December the 13th in Brighton. Um, I'm going to be at that London show and uh, if you do see me and you recognize me, please come up and say hello. Uh, also, considering the time of year and the time of the season, please don't hesitate to uh, bring with you an obscenely expensive gift. Um, I, I certainly won't be upset if you hand me one. So, um, yeah, hope to see uh, a couple of you guys around at that show. Um, I mean, and, and if you haven't seen uh, Damon play live yet, uh, they are absolute monsters on stage. Um, right, time for a quick round of what I'm cranking this week, uh, where I will tell you what to listen to so that you don't have to think for yourself. First up is the new single by Cattle Decapitation. Uh, it is called One Day Closer to the End of the World, and it's taken from their forthcoming record, Death Atlas, which is going to be released on the 29th of November on Metal Blade. Um, now, uh, I will say this about the uh, prestigious and illustrious What I'm Cranking This Week segment, and that is that most of the time I'm going to be talking to you about full-length albums, but um, considering the fact that, uh, that this single was good enough to motivate me to check out the uh, Cattle Decapitation back catalogue, I'm kind of going to um, exploit my own self-made loophole here. And anyway, the single is absolutely crushing. Um, that trademark blast groove craziness um, of their previous, um, previous albums is definitely still there. Um, but they've really turned the dial up on the melodic singing that worked so well in uh, the Anthropocene Extinction. And then in the second half of the song, they kind of hit you um, out of nowhere with this really like distinctly Norwegian black metal riff, which, which kind of sounds like it was always the long lost component of the cattle decapitation sound. And, and it just fits in absolutely perfectly. Uh, and speaking of sound, um, I actually played the song to uh, my friend Terry Ellis of the excellent uh, YouTube channel Pursuit of Perfect System. Um, and he is by no means a fan of, uh, of this kind of music. I mean, I think the heaviest thing that he's ever heard in his life is Guns N' Roses. But um, I mean, he even he commented that the production and the recording of this is, is absolutely stellar. Um, I mean, in my opinion, I think Cattle Decapitation are very fast approaching a... a pretty unassailable spot at the top of the uh, death metal heap. Um, I wouldn't be surprised um, to see this album uh, at the top of a lot of um, year year end best lists. Um, you know, I'm certainly more, more psyched than ever to hear what the album sounds like. So um, looking forward to November the 29th. In the meantime, uh, if you haven't done so yet, check out this, uh, this single and um, Along with the uh, the Damon Bandcamp link, I'm also going to be posting the, the, the links to all of the bands that I feature on the What I'm Cranking This Week segment uh, in the comments below. Next is another of my year's favorite albums so far. A band from Sweden called uh, This Gift is a Curse and their latest album, A Throne of Ash. 
uh, Throne of Ashes, the follow-up to 2015's All Hail the Swine Lord, um, and it came out on Seasons of Mist in June. So I've had some time to spend with it, and I mean, the more I listen to this, the more I love it. If you're not familiar with uh, this band's music, basically imagine a, a bonfire of hardcore crust, sludge and and black metal that is raging out of control and you'll start to form a pretty good idea of what these Swedish gentlemen sound like. Um, in my view, A Throne of Ash is probably the or nine of the darkest tracks that you are going to hear all year. It's just absolutely caustic, crushing, aggressive. Um, I, I can't really say more than that. If you haven't done so yet, be sure to listen to it um, as soon as humanly possible. And then finally, Mugwa age of excuse uh, which kind of appeared like an unholy apparition out of nowhere on uh, on youtube last week um and really it, it's every bit as excellent as the single they released a couple of weeks prior suggested it was going to be it, it's basically six tracks of super grim aggressive polish black metal across 43 minutes um the physical release date as far as i know is september the 27th but i can guarantee you that if you check it out beforehand um, you will uh, probably have listened to it plenty of times by then. I have actually noticed a couple of reviews that say that it's not as good as Exercises in Futility uh, that came out in 2015. I, I personally think this album edges it out just a tad, you know, purely by virtue of the, the songwriting. But you'll need to make up your own mind. Um, uh, in, in, again, in my view, absolutely superb album. Anyway, that is enough out of me for uh, for one episode. Next week, I'm going to be talking to Lior Sifer, a good friend of mine um, and a man that anyone into tattoos should be familiar with. Um, Lior and I are going to be talking about, surprise, surprise, tattoos, um, black metal, horror movies, and a whole lot more. So make sure that you check back in with us next Tuesday for that episode. Until then, have a great week, and I'll see you soon.